Arxan is now digital.ai. Join us at our booth in the virtual expo hall to learn how our app protection, white box cryptography, and threat analytics solutions can help you stay ahead of the evolving threat landscape. The growth of open source continues to accelerate. From Google and Microsoft to mom and pop shops, consuming open source is now an accepted way to build your tech stack. Increasingly, many organizations are recognizing the benefits of releasing their own internal code as open source software. For many companies, releasing an open source project is now an important part of establishing and maintaining tech cred with customers, investors, and potential recruits. At the same time, people also recognize that more eyes and more contributors can help spot bugs and take your product in new directions. However, in the rush to get code out the door, many organizations fail to implement necessary governance and security processes to protect both their own organization and downstream users of the project. Today, we're going to walk through processes and actions you can take to protect your org's open source efforts. To get started, let's talk about your two main concerns when it comes to releasing your code as open source software. The more apparent half of the equation is protecting your organization and your secret sauce. While it may seem like an obvious no-no, your organization probably has a dev or two who just doesn't see a problem taking your custom algorithm or other secret sauce and posting it on their public, personal GitHub. Even when you can control the outbound flow, internal code is rarely something you can just take and post publicly. Your internal source is probably filled with company-specific comments and integrations that reveal your internal infrastructure. It's great that you want to share with the world, but governance is needed. You need to protect your competitive advantage, and you need to ensure that releasing your code doesn't give attackers a foothold into your organization. At the same time, you also need to consider the people who will use your software. You have a responsibility to your downstream user community. While you may choose to release your code with a no liability open source license, the guiding principle here is still no dumping. If your org's open source page is just a graveyard for old and forgotten projects, you're doing it wrong. Even though no one is paying you, you still need to think about the members of your project's community as customers. The whole point of releasing your project is to get people to participate and to look good at the same time. If you don't put in the time to protect your users, you'll end up with a bunch of upset people and bad press. You wanna be on the top of Hacker News or Slashdot for being awesome, not for being the root cause of some data breach. Okay, now that we have the right mental frame, let's get started. The journey to secure, to secure your outbound open source initiative starts before the first commit. And before we talk about security, I wanna talk about your open source governance in a little bit more of a broad general sense. Let's start by talking about the importance of establishing your org's overall outbound open source governance process. While you may wanna just focus on security, realistically, you need to ensure the rest of the program is in place where you're going to end up with a lot of problems. This is a good opportunity to leverage, or I guess maybe to develop, those cross-functional relationships and influencing skills to bring in the right people. While going through all of this, remember that you need to build your process to be developer-centric. And an important part of this is bringing all parties into one combined workflow for all the vetting and approvals. If things are disjointed and your devs need to go through a lot of pain, they're either A, going to give up, or B, they're simply gonna bypass all of your org's processes anyway. To keep things secure, control the outbound flow. Now, that doesn't mean you need to make it a treacherous maze. What you wanna do is you wanna make it easy to do the right thing. This is gonna prevent people from just throwing up their code with no oversight. Trust me, the upfront pain to set all this up is much, much better than chasing an incident and cleaning up a mess later. To help you get started, I recommend checking out the repo at the bottom of the slide. While you're bringing in the right people and looking at some sample policies, there are a few key points I want you to keep in mind. First, you need to set up the right incentives for leadership and managers. Dev managers need to be part of the approval process. These are the people who usually know what's cool to share and what needs to stay locked up in the vault. At the same time, managers are often focused on internal delivery. You need to make them see the value to the org and to themselves of allotting people and time 
to properly oversee the project once you make it public. It's your job to help them see the light. Beyond managers, you wanna work closely with your legal and publicity departments. Remember, you're not just dumping code out there, you're building an extension of your organization. If you're going through all this effort, you wanna leverage your PR machine to get as many users and contributors on your project as possible. Your legal team is also an important partner. If your legal team does not have a lot of experience with open source, you may wanna seek outside counsel to help advise. There are actually a lot of issues around copyright management that can become important, even in an open source project. Take CLAs, for example. Developers typically hate CLAs because they feel like an, imped an impediment to sharing code. And you're also gonna just find some people who are simply ideologically opposed to them. The reality is that you probably do want a CLA in order to protect you later down the road. Microsoft, Google, and all of the big guys use CLAs. So they're pretty common now. If people don't like them, they can make their own fork and go their own way. Your legal team also plays an important role in determining what licenses should be used when you release your code. It's important to ensure that all of the various parts that you've stitched together in your application have compatible open source licenses. As you put everything together into a process, remember, we wanna make it easy, but we want a gate, not an open door. What do I mean by this? No one can actually create the repo on the public hosting provider without all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed. I like to say the process pays the toll. That said, the people responsible for setting up the repo need to be familiar with the different configuration options, permissions, and everything else that goes into setting up your repo. For example, you probably wanna ensure that all maintainers and contributors are using two-factor authentication for their accounts. Another topic that will come up is how do you handle outside contributors? While you definitely wanna encourage issue reports and PRs, it's generally unwise to allow some random person from the internet who has no skin in the game to make decisions about merges and other big decisions on your project. If members of the community aren't happy, you do need to listen to them, but ultimately they can fork your repo and go their own way. You need to stay in control. Now, related to this, remember that former employees are just that, not employees. You need to cut their access just like you would on any internal system. One other gotcha I wanna highlight, in security, most of us are accustomed to implementing some form of re-review and recertification. Other departments might not operate so cyclically. Work with your partners to ensure governance is an ongoing process. All right, now that we've helped to ensure a strong foundation for the overall process, let's talk security. Before we even talk about code, it's important to realize that there's a lot more going on with modern open source projects. If you think you just need to do a code review and some light pen testing, call it a day, I've got bad news for you. Let's think about all the different things that are needed to support an open source project. While in many cases, a good readme may be enough, you may find that the release team also wants to set up a full website to promote the project and host screenshots and documentation. You can minimize risk by keeping it simple and using something like a static site generator and GitHub pages, but the release team may wanna use their own tooling and integrate some dynamic features. And just like that, we've now added more apps and more infrastructure to manage and to secure. It's 2020, so chances are your team wants to use the same DevOps principles that they use for internal products. While there are plenty of build pipelines and tools available as free services for open source projects, you may wanna consider using infrastructure where you have a bit more control. If you look at the news of the past few years, these services are not always bug free or set up with security first principles you need to be thinking about data leakage and access control among other concerns. At the same time, even if you can utilize the same tools and patterns you use in-house, things aren't always the same as they are internally. Many projects make their build logs accessible to the community. How well do you know what's going on in your logging and what might be dumped out there for everyone to see? Now, if you determine you really do wanna make all these things public, you have to be extra, extra diligent about data leakage and protecting things like API keys, and other secrets that could be leaked in logs. Beyond CI and other automated testing, you probably wanna make your project available in some packaged form that can easily be integrated by downstream users without requiring cloning and going through a whole lot of work on your own. Think things like Maven Central, NPM, PyPy. 
Uh, this means even more services to understand and secure. For example, you'll want to set up your account on the package hosting site using a group mailing list and not individual or personal email addresses. This makes you resilient to changes in the team and can also help aggregate alerts for centralized review and reporting by the security team. For a lot of devs out there, once they set up an automated integration, it's out of sight and out of mind. You need to be sure that everyone is in the loop and stays in the loop. You're gonna to need to periodically audit these services to make sure things are as you expect. Platforms like GitHub really help centralize communications for things like suggesting new features and providing support, but the release team may also wanna set up a mailing list, forums, or chat. These communication tools need to be reviewed and secured like any other app or service your org uses. Lastly, you should think about establishing a social media presence as a preemptive defense. If your project becomes very popular, scammers will try to impersonate you and draw people into their copycat malware traps. You don't need to go crazy, but you wanna have an active presence where your community hangs out. It's a good idea to explicitly list all your official social channels on your site or in your readme so people know what is real. Now let's jump back to the code side of things. Probably the most natural security activity is doing some code review and pen testing type checks. If you're starting from an existing internal project, hopefully you're already in a pretty good place. At the same time, some teams may wanna start new projects that are open source from day one. Now it would be convenient if you could run your internal security tools directly against the public repo, but if there are licensing or other restrictions which make this too difficult, another strategy is to set up an internal mirror where you can treat the code just like you would any other internal code. Some repository hosting services may provide some security testing features like vulnerable dependency checking, or they may even have features that can block secrets from being committed to code. I definitely recommend that you take advantage of all options, but many of these baked in tools are not as robust as fully dedicated options. Make sure you do a gap assessment and understand what you actually get for free. Now, to hammer one point home, while it's 100% important to do a thorough review for that first public release, you need to remember that security is an ongoing process. You don't necessarily need to monitor every commit out there, but you need to ensure the project maintainers know when to reach out and bring you in for an in-depth review. Beyond buggy code, the next major security challenge is preventing leakage of the corporate secret sauce and other information that can be leveraged to attack your app or internal infrastructure. For starters, you should do a full review of your comments and configs. There are some easy wins, like setting up a very thoughtful git ignore file. In particular, you wanna make sure you're blocking people from committing local configs, which may contain secrets. And you also wanna block things like debug logs, which could be output into the working directory while running tests. Another area to pay attention to is naming conventions used for things like variables. These can leak internal structure or confidential information. So change these to generic but useful terms. This not only secures your code, but it also makes it more accessible to downstream users. Inside your repo, you will also likely have some supporting documentation. As part of your security review, you should review any supporting documents and things like screenshots to check for data leakage. You also wanna review these docs to vet default configurations or any security advice that needs updating. In addition, you need to ensure that security is properly called out in the project's readme which is the default homepage for the project. I recommend keeping the security section prominent, but small in both your readme and contributing documents. These documents can then link to a dedicated security file, which provides all the details about security related things, such as reporting bugs, your responsible disclosure policy, contact information, keys, whatever else you might wanna share. A security doc should be mandatory for all projects and it should be based upon a template owned and approved by the security team. From time to time, you may need to update and change the template, but luckily all it should take is a pull request to update existing repos. If you need some inspiration, check out the sample security doc I provide in the resources at the end of this presentation. As part of this process, ensure you have a formal responsible disclosure policy published someplace publicly. Your org should have one in general, but check to see that it aligns with your open source initiative. The same goes for your bug bounty program. The scope of a bug bounty program is usually very explicit. 
especially when you work with a vendor to manage your program. I strongly recommend you include your open source program in the scope of your bug bounty, even though the code is sitting out there for anyone to see and easily review. Remember, the whole point of the bug bounty program is to encourage responsible disclosure and prevent being surprised by someone making a public report. Now also recognize that if you do have a managed program, adding scope adds cost. Be prepared to make a case to management to invest in your program. Now that we've looked at what you're putting into the repo, let's talk about some supporting things like repo hosting. Your number one priority is bug-free code, but your next objective is to prevent unauthorized changes to your project. And that means putting some thought into access control for project hosting. You could set up your own hosting infrastructure, but most orgs look to use something like GitHub for ease and visibility. Now, many orgs wonder, do we need to force our developers to make separate work accounts on these platforms? I would say usually this is not necessary if you do things right. Remember, your devs probably want to double dip and get credit from their boss, as well as some external visibility on their profile. The key is to understand access control options and properly lock things down. One of the simplest things you can do is to ensure that everyone in your org has 2FA enabled on their account before they're granted access. In addition, if you're using GitHub, you can get some extra control by integrating your corporate Active Directory as an additional access control. More broadly, enforce strong and minimal access control policies. Only the project leads need owner permissions on the repo, and all other permissions should follow basic minimum necessary access principles. Good RBAC is important, not only on the repo hosting, but on any other service or supporting infrastructure needed for your open source project. Lastly, Make sure you and your team are ready. This means ensuring that everyone knows their role and their responsibilities. You don't want to run into a situation where an important security disclosure goes ignored because no one, text, no one checks the team inbox. For things like code reviews and pre-release validations, use the same rigor or better that you would for an internal project. And be double sure about everything that you are doing. Have clear documentation and run books for your team but also be sure that your policies and procedures for the devs are clearly written and easy to find. I'd even go as far as saying you should force devs to read the policy and pass a mini quiz as part of the gating process before you grant them access to any public facing services. Remember, everything they do will be out there for anyone to see. So far we've discussed setting up your governance foundation and how to go about prepping a repo for release. Now, Let's take a look at the role security plays in the actual release process. As we discussed earlier, you need to do a full code review and audit of the project before it is released. But be sure that your test code that's in the final state for that initial release. If this is from an existing internal project, do not rely on previous testing because the changes that you needed to make so that it would be independent of your internal infrastructure could be significant. As part of your review, you should be looking at the code as well as any dependencies. Check, is the team using libraries that are having constant security problems? If so, now is the right time to remind them about your bug bounty program and about the dollar signs attached to that. Beyond that, remember, your reputation is at risk. If the code relies upon duct tape, especially around security, you should push for substantive changes before allowing anything out the door. Lastly, do one final review of variable names and comments. This check should go beyond data leakage. Check that good comments are present or go ahead and add them. You wanna make clear callouts for any security risks and you wanna make sure that if there's some kind of easy to trip up configuration, that you have the proper documentation and context so people can properly stay secured. Your pre-release review should also include reviewing the documentation, readme, and anything else you might have in your repo that's not code. Check that every link points where you expect. It is very easy to make a typo for something like a packages download link. From experience, I can tell you that these things do happen and bug bounty researchers know to look for these things. Save some money and check those links. Lastly, you need to ensure the actual repo set up on GitHub or other hosting provider is configured properly. For example, your dev team may wanna allow wikis but this means that anyone can change your documentation without any approval process. And that means that people can use your wiki for watering hole attacks, such as directing people to download a fake 
malware infested version of your app. Instead, opt for documentation in a folder inside the main repo or set up another repo somewhere that enforces an approval workflow. This enables the community to participate, but for your org to have the final say. And do yourself one more favor before going any further. Do one final access control check and make sure things are locked down. By now, you have done all your checks and you're ready to actually publish some code. But be careful, there's still some nuance in how you go forward. First, if you are taking an existing project and making it public, I strongly recommend copying and pasting the code without the Git folder and the Git history. The old history may include comments, secrets, internal email addresses, and a lot of other juicy information. Even if you use a private repo on the Git hosting provider, create a brand new clean slate instead of just switching from private to public mode. In addition, remember to consider any supporting infrastructure like CI CD, testing, integrations, et cetera. You want to review the specific setup needed for this project. Keep in mind that this will introduce a new area of upkeep, library, and patch management. If you haven't already, think about how you might be able to ingest any logs from these apps and services for internal monitoring and processing. In some cases, you may just make the source code available, but generally, you will also host a package or binary somewhere like NPM. While you can let the project team set everything up, review their configurations, and be sure that there is a process to receive and monitor any and all alerts before going any further. Now, before we continue, I wanna to touch on one other point. We have generally been focused on protecting your org, but you have a responsibility to your project community. Even if you aren't a large, well-resourced company, this is the rule, not the exception. First, remember that complexity is often the root cause for many security problems. If you have a large, confusing code base or one with many unnecessary dependencies, you are adding risk. It will be harder for people to properly set up and secure your code, and they are likely to miss steps as well. Instead, influence the project team to decompose the application into pluggable parts that can be more easily maintained and monitored. From the security perspective, you should aim to deliver code with secure defaults and secure sample configs. Your documentation should stress the importance of security and not say things like, if security is important to you, then do this. Now, at the same time, think about how you can make security easy and pluggable. For example, suggest using a secrets management integration rather than saying it's okay to put hard-coded passwords in a config file. You may want to propose specific tech and services for hosting that could make things easier and less error-prone for all those DIYers out there. However, good security should be flexible and pluggable. Securing your app shouldn't be reliant on a very specific tech stack no one outside your org uses. Overall, you should be clear and explicit when it comes to security. Warn against the things that may be easy to do, but they're not recommended from a security standpoint. Also, if you are releasing an app with security gaps or security features, which are not yet ready for prime time, call these out explicitly. It's okay to release open source code that isn't production ready, but be clear and provide appropriate guidance and warnings. Remember, security should never be left as an exercise to the reader or the downstream user. All right, congratulations. You've now done your part and released some useful and hopefully secure open source code. However, you need to remember that the project is living code and must be treated the same way as any in-service app that you use internally. Let's start with the basics. One of the core principles to remember is the no dumping rule. The point of open source isn't to share your discarded old projects, but to share something useful and allow people to contribute back. When a project is ignored, it makes the community upset and that can have negative repercussions for your org, going as far as a potential cyber attack. If the project team isn't going to actively monitor what's going on, it should not fall on the security team's shoulders. You should be clear with your developers and their managers that unsupported projects will be shut down. This is why gaining manager and leadership buy-in early on as part of the approval process is so critical. Appropriate time and resources must be dedicated to the project. With the right support in place, you can be proactive and properly engage your project's community. 
This means more than just monitoring issues and pull requests. You need to ensure you have a fleshed out communications plan. For example, let's say you need to disclose a major security bug and release an update. How will you let people know? This could include notes on your project's readme, uh, using some kind of notification system built into the package management platform, or simply using a mailing list. Beyond code related issues, you need to have a plan to periodically review all of the supporting infrastructure, like your CI CD pipeline and package hosting. The project team should be tasked with upkeep, but security should do their own checks periodically as well. Actions may include upgrades, reviewing settings, and changing access control permissions. People come and go and change teams all the time. Make sure that permissions are current and appropriate. Now, all of this is just a starting point to build out your monitoring strategy. But remember that you need to treat your open source projects with the same rigor that you would your internal software. Now, another component of monitoring requires going beyond your code and services. As your project becomes more popular, there's a heightened risk that a malicious actor will try to impersonate you for nefarious ends. I hope you didn't choose a hard to spell name for your project, but even if you use something simple, you need to be on the lookout for typo squatting. All an attacker needs to do is look for a typo in some blog post or pump up their own fake tutorial linking to a fake version of your code or some scam site. This not only endangers your project community, but, can it, in, but it can impact your reputation. Related to this, look for unofficial mirrors on other platforms you're not using. Forks are of course okay, but even if the code is clean today, there is always a chance an attacker is just waiting for volume before slipping in a backdoor. Be sure any mirrors you don't manage do not claim to be official. If and when your project gets really big and popular, you will likely set up some social media profiles or establish an official presence on a forum like Reddit. You may opt not to go through all that effort, but you still wanna monitor what is going on to weed out scammers and to counteract bad security advice. You may also find that people go to some place like Stack Overflow and inadvertently expose some security issue while posting their question. So you need to keep your eyes open and cast a wide net. Speaking of security issues, hopefully you remember to establish a responsible disclosure policy and process. Whether you have a fancy bug bounty program with a submission form, or you just direct people to email security at your org, be realistic and realize that people may reach out to you in other ways. As a general best practice, you want to ensure that security is included in emails sent to addresses like root at your domain and webmaster at your domain. Some people may also look up the who is information for your website and use that to try to reach out to you. Now, on the other hand, people may raise a PR or raise an issue directly because they don't realize it's actually a security issue. Some other people may not agree with your responsible disclosure policy. Some people may philosophically believe the right approach is just to post a security problem right there in public. While you hope people don't go down this path, it will happen. Be sure that the owning team is staying on top of things and knows when to bring in a security team. You should also investigate ways to ingest PR and issue data directly into your internal intelligence and analysis tools. Now, if someone does report an issue publicly on your tracker, resist the urge to take it down. This will reflect poorly to the community. Instead, ensure this issue is properly escalated internally to get quick action. If your platform supports tagging issues and PRs, show that you are in the know and add a security tag for visibility and a call out for help. For issues which were initially disclosed privately, when you do post a fix, you should also use the security tag as part of a call to action for upgrades. Above all else, you need to always remember that when people are disclosing a security bug, they are doing you a favor. They could instead attack you or sell it off to a vendor or a malicious actor. Therefore, always remember to properly engage people who report security bugs. Keep the reporter in the loop as you work through the issue and be polite and thankful, even if they are rude or didn't give you the most coherent bug report. When people are ignored, they will eventually get tired of waiting, and that could lead to a public disclosure coupled with some massive shade in that blog post they write. You want to control the narrative and demonstrate that your code is great and your org truly cares about security. Lastly, always remember this is publicly accessible code. Even if the report was non-public, someone else may discover the same thing. It is imperative that the owning team understands their responsibility to act promptly to security reports. 
Hopefully your project meets a need and finds a great community. But tech changes quickly, so you need to be prepared for end of life considerations. Internally, you may move on to a new technology or perhaps someone forked your project and now their new project is better and more advanced than your original. Whatever the case may be, you need to have a game plan for shutting down your project at the appropriate time in order to do right by the community and to properly manage your internal resources and time. Before focusing on your internal needs, I wanna talk about your role in hosting a community project. Whether software is free or commercial, no one likes hearing that support ended yesterday. No one likes to scramble to find a replacement or risk being stuck with buggy and vulnerable code. Worse, this is open source software. You probably have community members who are investing their own time and effort to help you and everyone else. You do not want to alienate people. This could be a really big misstep. Was someone in the community about to responsibly disclose a security bug? Is some dev out there a potential new recruit for your company? Keeping this in mind, you need to set up a plan and timeline for the deprecation of your project. This allows people time to react and make their own plans. You should also be thinking about forking or maybe suggesting a good alternate that downstream users can migrate to. As part of the process, clearly communicate the point in time when you'll be fully shutting down and ending support versus possibly just stopping new pull requests and responding to bug reports. An important consideration as you start down this road is whether you're going to keep using the code internally after the public deprecation. Remember, the code will always be public. So in most cases, you should not stop external support unless you are also deprecating and decommissioning the software internally as well. A topic that often comes up in discussions about decommission is whether you can or should transfer ownership of the project. 99% of the time, this is a bad idea and should be explicitly prohibited in your policy. You can see several cases in the news where a project owner transferred ownership and then the new maintainer turned around and did something nefarious like adding trackers or crypto miners. Even if you make a big announcement about the transfer, some people won't hear it and you end up with upset users who still think that you are responsible. You need to remember that there is a lot of supporting infrastructure as well, like package management and testing to consider. It can be very hard to decouple everything without risking leakage or unauthorized access to some of your internal systems. The whole point of free and open source software is that someone can take the code and run with it, right? If there are people who are interested in taking your project forward, let them fork it and let them establish a new identity. On first glance, it may seem like you are making developers' lives easier if you keep all the names and package locations the same, but this obscures a change and prevents people from making an informed decision. Now, if you have a community, you can seek out someone to fork the project and take it forward. You may even choose to endorse a particular fork. But at the end of the day, downstream users are responsible for managing their own dependencies. This means doing the necessary research to determine what action to take when a dependency is no longer supported. Now that you have a plan and you are ready to turn things off, let's take a look at some of the actions you actually need to take. First, Document and communicate everywhere. This means update your readme and update your website. With many package management systems, you can mark a package as deprecated or no longer supported. Research these mechanisms so you have the greatest chance of people learning about your decommission plans. I also recommend that you develop a set of templates you use for the deprecation and decommission processes. The teams can then use the boilerplate in the readme and elsewhere. This will help to ensure that everything is communicated appropriately and consistently. Now to get you started, check out the templates and the resources at the end of this presentation. When it finally comes time to pull the plug, put your repo into read-only mode on your project hosting provider. Even if you plan to delete the repo long-term, leave it up for a while to help avoid any confusion. In addition, remove all but the security group's access permissions to the repo to prevent unexpected changes after decommission. If some last minute or post-mortem update really is needed, you can always add someone's permissions back temporarily. Also, you need to ensure that you have an accurate inventory of all the supporting infrastructure and services that you're using. Take appropriate action to turn off and cancel these services where possible. If you are leaving things online, ensure all comms notifications are redirected to the security team for review. Remember, 
An active service that is not maintained is likely to accrue new security volumes over time. Lastly, even after everything is said and done, you should still periodically monitor and expect some security reports. Be prepared to take action when it makes sense. We've now gone through the full life cycle of an open source project and looked at how we can integrate security. As more and more organizations see the value of releasing their code as free and open source software, it is important to appropriately consider and manage risk. Planning how to roll out and secure your open source process is going to take some time and a good amount of thought. However, it is really important to set firm expectations and to ensure you have good practices and procedures ready to go. Remember, you're putting something out there that is fully visible and transparent. You don't have any firewall to hide behind. Go into all of this knowing that securing the code is an important part of the process, but not the only part. You will likely depend on various services and infrastructure to set up and maintain your open source project. And this means more things out there to secure and protect. And once you've set everything up, you need to be continually monitoring and you need to continually involve security all the way through decommissioning and turning off the lights. Lastly, open source is about more than code. It is important that you properly manage communication in general and more specifically about security, and that means in both directions. You want people to report issues to you and you have a responsibility to downstream users to do your best to help them stay secure. If you keep all of this in mind, you can help add value to your org's open source efforts and help keep everyone secure. Now, go out there and release some code.